California is surrounded by the fertile fields on the lush central coast. Its nickname is Salad Bowl. Two thirds of its 150,000 residents are of Mexican descent. Salinas is a small town, but it has changed dramatically in the past 20 years. Deborah Aguilar has lived here all her life. As a little girl, I remember it was just a small town. I wish I could still say it is, but. It's not like the way it was. It was just a peaceful, good town. Known for the Rodeo, known for the Artichoke Festivals, known for just John Steinbeck, you know, lived here and, oh, and it's different now. It's not the same. In the mid 1990s, Deborah had to move with her sons to the east side of Salinas, an area known for gangs. Her oldest son got beaten up. He was seriously wanting a gun. And I started to cry when he said he needed a gun. He goes, I'm serious. I need a gun. I'm going to get a gun, Dad, and you guys are going to have to buy me one. What? No. Deborah's son, Stefan, was more interested in music than gangs. He had lost some close friends to the violence, so he knew how bad it was on the streets of Salinas. He took the back roads to avoid trouble. One night, Coming home from the neighborhood 7-Eleven, he was followed. The person drove up alongside of my son, opened fire, and killed him. He was dead at the scene. I couldn't say goodbye to my son. They couldn't find me. I would have broke through those cops. You know, I would have wanted to see my son and hug him. The situation now in Salinas is just way out of hand, and, and it's sad because now you hear about murders left and right. I think last year we, we hit like something like 20 homicides, all gang related. It's terrible. I mean, every, every kid practically has a gun. You don't see fights no more. You see drive-bys, and that's a common thing in Salinas nowadays. You don't expect it, you know, trauma like that to happen. I used to think, oh, gosh, poor Tony's mom, poor, poor, poor Mikey's mom, and say, cut off. Oh, that must feel. And I would look at my boys and say, God, if that happened to me, no, gosh. No, you never think it's going to happen to you. A murder went to me. I hate with the passion. And all you fools are going to be past this. My God, not was hit. Hundreds of young men have been buried in Salinas since 1990, many of them gang members and many innocent victims. I thought I saw compassion for my dead homie and other dead Mexican dying lonely in the guy. The murder rate in Salinas is similar to Los Angeles. In some neighborhoods, it is a war zone. The Salinas gang unit investigates the murders and has scores of open cases. We're dealing primarily with the rivalry between northern gangs and southern gangs. Our uh, southern gangs associate with the color blue, uh, the letter M being the 13th letter of the alphabet, or reference back to the Mexican mafia. You'll see it displayed in Roman numeral XIII, Trece, and uh, a shortened version of X3. I'm a gunner, 
Northern gangs um, associate with the letter N for uh, Norteño or Northerners. The letter N is the 14th letter in the alphabet. They display the number 14 both in graffiti and in their tattoos. I started running with gangs when I was like 12. I'd say about seventh grade. Well, once you're in, you're in. There's no backing down. I felt, I felt like I was finally a part of something. Just started hanging around with them a lot more. They're like my family. They are my family. When I was growing up, the positive that I seen in gangs was that, for one, it got me respect. I wanted to be respected as a person, as a, as a young man. I wanted to be accepted. I wanted to be loved. So when I, I looked into the homeboys, they, and, and they, every time they seen me, man, they had smiles on their faces, and, and they would embrace me. The first thing, they put their hand out there, and they shook my hand, and they put their arm around my shoulder, and then I knew I belonged. Armando Frias is the son of Mexican immigrants whose involvement in gangs would have terrible repercussions for his family. When little Mondo was born, I was 17 years old. I said, man, this guy's got to be great. He's going to be someone great. We had dreams that little Mondo was going to be in the NBA. He was going to play in the NFL. You know, he was going to make history. You know, you, you, you dream big dreams for your children. I was a kid myself, you know, having a kid. And uh, I didn't really know how to be a parent. The only thing at the time that I knew and I believed in was in the gang I was in. So I, I, I knew I was going to teach little Mondo that. I knew I was going to teach him how to be, be down. The gang has been around for well over 30 years now, and the gang influence that has happened in the city, we've seen grandfathers pass it on to their sons who pass it on to their sons. Being involved in the gang is a religion to them. That's what they're taught at home. That's how they're raised. The problem just is becoming an association for the family rather than an individual. I remember, um, when he was about eight years old, I started just taking him places with me. By the time he was 12, he knew how to, he knew how to drive my car, so when I was too drunk from a party, he was gonna drive me and my homeboys around if we needed to get around anywhere, and he literally, he did that. Little Mondo first shot a gun at six years old. He joined the Norteño gang at nine and committed his first armed robbery at age 12. I remember one time, you know, I was drunk, you know, and, and there was this kid that was picking on Mondo. You know, and Armando evidently was afraid of him, you know, and didn't want to fight this guy, didn't want to fight this guy. And I remember approaching Armando with so much anger, I was telling him, what's wrong with you? Why are you a, a, a wimp? You know, don't you know that you have to be a killer? You better start learning how to be a killer. Armando Frias' son, Little Mando, would spend his teenage years in and out of youth prison. I've always seen myself as an Norteño ever since I was a kid. I mean, gangs have always been involved in my family, so it's family and the gang kind of went together. Earliest memories is, you know, when I was young, maybe, you know, four or five years old. Remembering my dad not being around, but remember waking up early in the morning on the weekends to go visit him in prison. He was in there for a murder. My gang life, my violence that I lived, unfortunately took me away from him. And I wasn't able to be there when I need, really needed to be there for him. I wasn't there. I've, I've always wanted to be like my dad. I always, I always looked up to older homeboys, you know, and, and I remember the stories they used to tell when they used to get out, just being around, being young, going to parties and about, oh, yeah, you know, I did this now when I was older, oh, this is what happened. Or, you know, they didn't think I was listening, but I used to listen to a lot of, you know, war stories that they used to talk amongst each other. You know what I'm saying? So I wanted bad, you know what I'm saying, to be able to get out and tell my own. Armando Frias Sr. now visits Little Mando on Saturdays. I feel very guilty today about what I taught my son. You know, I, um, I created a lot of what he is today. If I wouldn't have been gone so much, you know, I could have led him a different route. You know, if I would have known the things I know today about where 
all my life was gonna lead and my son's life was gonna lead, I would've never gotten involved in gangs the way I did. Visiting my son is always a difficult thing to do because every time I go visit my son, I wanna take him home with me and I can't do that. I love my son and to see him, him in the predicament that he's in, that's just something that, you know, is very, very hard to accept. Lil Mondo says he didn't have to end up in prison. There is a point when young men choose the gang life either out of fear, peer pressure, or the lure of easy drugs and money. This is what we do on a daily basis, post up, make some money from all the dope fees out there. In Salinas neighborhoods, the easy money comes with a price. Make a little bit of bread. Norteños are always on the lookout for their enemies, the sureños. They call them scraps. They come back, we go back. They come back, we go back. They come back, we go back four times harder. Why do we hate scraps? Ask one of my friends, why do we hate scraps? They shot my little homeboy right here. They shot my homeboy back in the head. I got shot right here in the leg. Scrap put the gun to my head. I said, pull the trigger. He put it down, shot my leg. He was afraid. Show the hip shot. Faced with daily threats, the gangs give kids protection, a sense of power. I don't care what other people think. I don't care how other people feel. I know how it makes me feel to get over on arrival. It makes me feel good. It gives me a feeling I can't explain off or on camera. Just get these chills and it feels good. This gang member was arrested just weeks after going on camera. And once in the juvenile justice system, many young men end up getting more involved in gangs. That's what happened to Lil Mando. First, I went to juvenile hall, from juvenile hall, they ended up sending me to a boys' ranch. From the boys' ranch, I ended up going to a group home. From the group home, I ended up going to YA, which is California Youth Authority. The YA has become little more than a place where gangs teach kids to believe in what they call their cause. YA is just a, it's a schooling ground. There are certain things you have to go through in YA that are going to pretty much make you more, more of a man, that type of trip, you know? Nortenio cause is basically not taking no abuse or not taking no uh, disrespect, not taking nothing from, from the Eme and Sureños, you know what I'm saying? Eme, which is the Mexican Mafia. I said, stop, oh yeah, what's that sound? Everybody watching what's going down. The Norteño cause was inspired in part by the struggles of Mexican-American immigrant farm workers in the 1960s. Cesar Chavez was really active at the time when I was growing up, and I, I remember that really, really clear because there was, that was the happening at the time. I remember Cesar Chavez fighting for the injustices that were being done to the farm worker, and I really just, it just caught my interest, you know, that someone would stand up for the campesino. My parents came to Salinas from Mexico in my, in my early years as a child, you know, I remember working in the fields myself because, uh, you know, we, were, we weren't well off. And I remember my father telling us that if we wanted to dress nice for school, that we had to work. And uh, I started working about at 10 years old. I started bunching onions at Kubota Farms. At that time, the gangs were not yet a problem in rural areas like Salinas. The first big Latino gang was based out of Los Angeles and called the Mexican Mafia, La M it soon became a major force within the California prison system. Rural Latinos who got in trouble were considered outsiders by the Yemen, and to protect themselves, they unified. I remember when we went to prison, we were looked at as farm boys, like we were just ignorant farm workers, and we were, gonna, we were ready to prove to our, anybody, hey, you know what, we're not about ignorant, and we're not just farm workers, this is what we can do. See, when Cesar seen El Campesino, he seen somebody everybody forgot about but yet he was a, an asset to society. He worked the agriculture fields. He united the campesino, you know, united farm workers. We united as, as farm boys behind the wall. The bread that we, we stood for was the blood that was shed in, in, in our sacrifice for our cause. Back in those days, the Emmy were preying upon those that were not part of the Emmy. You know, so they would prey upon 
the Norteños, you know, they'd have them pay rent, you know, kill them, have them bring in drugs or what have you. Well, you had a couple of individuals who were just as hard, if not harder than the AME, who didn't like what was going on. So then they decided to create the NF. At first, the NF, Nuestra Familia, was purely a prison gang. They wrote a constitution outlining their cause, borrowing from the message of Cesar Chavez, but ignoring his commitment to nonviolence. They stood for unity, education, and protection. Nuestra Familia had a military type background. A lot of them had been in Vietnam, and they brought that military structure with them to their new organization, the Nuestra Familia. And they had a general, and they had captains, and they had right down to what they called soldados, they're soldiers. Police officer George Collard organized a gang task force to investigate the Nuestra Familia. The machine is an exercise regimen that every NF member in prison go through every day. Soldiers in the Army, when they train together and go through really tough times together, it brings them closer together. One of the main things that people got to understand out there is that in order to have an organization run, you got to have discipline. You know, so a lot of these old timers, they instilled this discipline. And then when you got discipline, you start instilling respect and you start getting loyalty. They struck their enemies with a precision that uh, was of military planning, which made it very efficient and uh, a chain of command that, that orders would go up and go back down. And it really took the, the California Department, Department of Corrections by surprise. I mean, it was a violent, violent time in the CDC. In 1989, the violence led the California Department of Corrections to build Pelican Bay, a supermax prison to house their most dangerous inmates. Isolated at the top of Northern California, Pelican Bay soon became the headquarters of the Nuestra Familia. For me, I was sent to Pelican Bay in 1994. I was only 24 years old at the time. I remember arriving in Pelican Bay like, oh, you know, I just reached the pinnacle of my career. You know what I mean? I mean, this is what it was all about. Pelican Bay, this were all the big homies were all the ones who started it all, the big carnaz, everyone that's calling the shots and who I take my orders from. I mean, this is this was where it was. I was in charge of educating other people, Norteños or other structure members. I started educating them on the bonds, on the format, Aztec history, how to make weaponry, war tactics, where to stab somebody. And I was educating people on that. One of the people Epi Cortina trained in NF law was Willie Stokes Ramirez, an NF associate from Salinas. Those rules and laws they have talks about striving for a better education, self-respect, social status of equality. I mean, all these things are in there. Being a youngster, I read this. It was like, I never read this before. I mean, I never heard of something like this. It was like, oh, like the United States Constitution only was their constitution. We also educated them on their basic education, such as reading, writing, math. We studied business, how to, you know, take over business, how to build a business, illegal ventures, whether there were bank robberies, armored car robberies, murder, extortion, money laundering. If there was money involved in it, we educated them. And it all sounded, man, like, oh yeah, you know, just, man, I'm somebody now. It made me feel like, oh yeah, I'm really gonna do something for the betterment of my raza. By the mid-1990s, the NF had thousands of members in California prisons. As these members paroled, the NF saw an opportunity to expand to the streets. The military structure allowed the NF generals to issue orders from Pelican Bay and to demand part of the cash from street crimes. They sent soldiers to set up regiments all over Northern California. And when we started doing is schooling all these youngsters. You know what I mean? They used us in order to go to school, our little brothers, our little cousins, you know what I mean? Not knowing what we were doing, all we were doing was setting them up to fill our shoes when we were no, no longer useful to them. And so you got youngsters that they may not be doing well in school, they may be getting beat up by people on their way home, and if suddenly this hand reaches down and says, you can be part of the cause, and we will protect you as long as you show loyalty, as long as you're a good soldier. I mean, that's a powerful, 
powerful message. If it sounds good and looks good, well, they're gonna go with it. And the thing is, the way the NF operates is that they just continue just to pound it into them, pound it into them, pound it into them. This is what our cause is about, this is what the struggle is about, until you really start believing it. But little do these kids know, they're just feeding them a bunch of bull and they're just using them for their own benefit and financial gain. 25% of all money raised through street crime by Norteños is supposed to be sent up the line to the NF leaders. Moving up from a street level Norteño to become an elite NF member is seen as a big achievement on the street. Even though they are locked up, the NF leaders control the money and make life and death decisions to keep the whole structure running smoothly. I was in charge of orchestrating hits, who would go do them, you know, who was deemed no good, who was a threat out there. And because of my activities out there of, you know, causing violence directly or indirectly, landed me in the shoe. The shoe, the security housing unit of Pelican Bay, is a prison inside a prison built to isolate the most violent gang leaders who are credited with organizing hundreds of murders, both inside and outside of prison. Fidel de la Riva held the highest rank of the Nuestra Familia. He was one of three top generals, but like Epi and Willy, he has just dropped out of the NF. For safety, he will soon be moved away from the other leaders who are kept in solitary confinement in the shoe. One has to understand that one sits in the cell day in, day out. He sits back there with no monitoring, you know. As far as what one does in the cell, you know, 24 hours a day and shit, you know. Uh, one has nothing but time but to think and plot. They hone those skills of manipulation because that's what got them to the top to begin with. And they hone the skills of, of writing and seduction to keep the people below them thinking that, that they are still in power, and it works. So long as there's just mail coming in and visits, messages are always conveyed or read out small. It could be anything from messages to orders to what kind of plans they have for the streets or the business of the familia. CDC gang investigators at every prison monitor gang communications. At Pelican Bay, they must read through close to 500 pieces of mail every day, much of it with messages hidden deep within. The gangs have resorted to using codes so that they can pass along their messages without the general officer knowing what is being communicated. In this particular case, one of the prison gang members here with the Nuestra Familia puts it in code. It's every word prior to a comma. One thing that's uh, well known to Nuestra Familia is what's called mini writing. And you can see uh, how small they can get, trying to get so many words or lines within a certain space. Um, on these wheelas or these notes, there will be communications, the Constitution, hit lists. This is just a very small fraction of what does get uncovered. There, there's probably not a day that goes by that we don't find letters that deal with some type of criminal activity being generated from people here to the streets or to other prisons. With money to be made, these mobsters control a vast network that reaches from Pelican Bay, 450 miles south to Salinas. Salinas is seen as almost a mystical place by the NF. It's sort of, you know, I wouldn't equate it with Mecca so much, but it is Salas, S-A-L-A-S. -A you see Salas tattooed on a gang member. He's got immediate credibility. Salinas is just seen as the cradle of civilization for the NF. A lot of the old time players came from Salinas and it continues to be a giant recruiting ground. On the streets of Salinas, the war between the NF and the Mexican mafia is played out every day by the Norteños and Sureños. For the last decade, as the prison gangs sought to control more territory, the fighting on the streets got worse. 
As a father, Armando Frias worried that his son would become a casualty of this war. My son was going to be better than me. His goals were to do a lot more worse things than I'd done. Um, at, at such a young age, the doors were open for him to get involved in a deeper scale of gangs. I'm talking about organized crime, something I never got involved with. I never got involved at that level. I started really associating with ANF in 2000, you know, and this this time when I got out, you know, in, in 2001 when I, when I paroled, there was a lot of things expected of me. Leo Mando was assigned to a regiment in Salinas that was carrying out NF orders on the streets. Once you make a commitment to the gang, it is enforced by blood. I mean, my life was, you know what I'm saying, was the cause, you know, that, that was my life, you know what I'm saying? I was ready to go and do, you know what I'm saying, do whatever I had to do for him, you know? That was just what was in me. Oh, uh, that scared me. You know, it was gonna be out of my hands and, and there's nothing I was gonna be able to do for my son you know, when once he made that commitment, because when you make that kind of commitment, you're saying, my family's second, this is first. Leo Mando's regiment was tasked with running an NF-controlled area of Salinas called Chinatown. They ran guns and dealt in drugs. We like to call this crystal mess. This one makes us more loony. Drugs, guns, and theft are the main money makers of the young soldiers. They use terror and threats of violence to keep Salinas residents quiet. Take a life, a person's life doesn't mean nothing to me. Doesn't mean nothing at all. I could care less for the family, I care less for that person that died. You wanna hurt one of us, we're gonna hurt one of you guys. And if your mom was gonna cry, oh wow, it's not my mom. Hundreds of mothers in Salinas are crying. After the death of her son, Deborah Aguilar fell into a deep depression. To fight back, she founded a support group for those who have lost their loved ones. When we lost Joey, it's just like a big piece of the family is gone now. And uh, they didn't even know Joey. You know, maybe he looked at him the wrong way, but uh, it didn't give him a chance. He just took a part of my life that I'll never, never, ever be replaced. This town is just so full of violence. It's like, yeah, we thought about, you know, leaving, and people go, why don't you move, you know, and I, why don't you get a new house? And I go, that, that's not an option. This is my house. I raised my son here. I'm not going to leave my house. They want to see us scared, and they want to mm -hmm. see us hide, and they mm -hmm. want to see us not say anything and mm -hmm. be quiet and be scared of these people. But we're not going to surrender to them and what they want. We can't do it alone. You know, we, we need to have everybody come together and, you know, do stuff to let them know that we're still out here and we still do care about living in this town, and they're not going to push us away. Located arrest 273-5-166, primarily methamphetamine, and the victim states he is very violent. Police departments all over Northern California were working on the gang problem and uncovering links to the Nuestra Familia. Hit lists with hundreds of names on them were intercepted. Something had to be done. Law enforcement made the decision to go after the NF leadership using the RICO prosecutions that had brought down the Mafia. In the late 1990s, they turned to the feds for help. We brought in the, the FBI, the Federal Bureau of Investigation, and they were able to bring resources that we did not have. What we tried to do was to mirror the web of, of the gang with our own web of law enforcement officers. George Collard was part of a police and FBI task force that began a long-term investigation codenamed Black Widow, secret even within the police. And as investigators in Operation Black Widow, we not only went after the guy who pulled the trigger, but who ordered that person to pull the trigger? 
you've got an organization here that is killing people and they're doing it by ordering people to be killed from inside prison and out on the streets. It was a real eye-opener for a lot of people. The strategy of the Black Widow investigation was to attack the leadership of the Nuestra Familia at Pelican Bay, men like these who run the NF from behind bars. But how do you punish men who are already serving life in prison? Colord says the plan was to remove these men from Pelican Bay and scatter them throughout the federal prison system. To succeed, investigators chose to recruit high-level informants to get inside the gang. Our first informant that started Operation Black Widow, he introduced us to some of the biggest players in Salinas. We began to develop this picture of a spider's web that stretched all over Northern California. In Salinas, Leo Mando and his NF associates were unaware that the FBI was investigating the Nuestra Familia and was secretly recording meetings of NF commanders on the streets. Danny Hernandez, a hardcore NF captain recently paroled from Pelican Bay, had been put in charge of the streets of Northern California, including Little Mando's regiment. He was a general for the streets. He was the main guy for the streets. As far as Northern California, running all regiments. He was well respected. He had a lot of pool, you know what I mean? He had a reputation. And then he said, win. And then he said, don't do what didn't happen. You know, because if you went against what he said, you're, you're gonna get killed, basically. The FBI watched as NF regiment leaders gathered for meetings. A dispute was brewing in Salinas over drug dealing. An NF dropout had moved in on their territory. He's making threats, you know what I'm saying, to the NF. He's making us look bad, nothing's happened to him. What should be done, this and that. Leo Mando and four other sources say Danny Hernandez gave the green light to go after the NF dropout in a phone call several weeks after this meeting. Green light on this guy. You guys know what you guys got to do. You guys are men. Handle your business. You know? Danny Hernandez did say that. Word went out on the street that the NF dropout, Raymond Sanchez, was a marked man. FBI audio tape captures Lil Mando's superiors talking about the hit. Yeah, I told Rook if he was he waiting out to lady him up, beat him up back. Why do we have the three stars to beat him up? I'm not feeling my shit for the The next day, Lil Mando went to Cap Saloon in downtown Salinas and ran into Raymond Sanchez. Inside the bar, a security camera captured what happened next. We went to have a couple beers, you know, right there at Caps, play some pool and everything. We're out there, say, probably about a half hour. Then you see Raymond Sanchez come in. I went, let my channel know that, you know, this person was here. What, what do you want me to do? Leo Mando was told to wait while his superior came to the bar with a gun. As soon as he came right over, you know, uh, went outside, you know what I'm saying, talked to him about, what, you know, what was going to happen. When I walked in there, he was still drinking at the bar. I went, you know what I'm saying, went to the jukebox, came up behind him, shot him. For the moment, nothing really planned out, you know, just, you know, do it the way, I mean, the best way I could, you know. As I'm running out, you know, uh, I see his friend Joe Cantu come back in. He's in my way, you know what I'm saying? So I shoot him too, just to get him out of the way. Leo Mando was 19 years old when he shot and killed Raymond Sanchez. I didn't care what the consequences were going to be because I was willing to take that sacrifice because it's something I believed in. If it took me to go and do the rest of my life in prison for killing this guy and it's doing something that I believe in, oh wow, you know what I'm saying? Because that's the sacrifice I was willing to take, you know what I'm saying? That's how much I believed in the cause. 
Leo Mondo was arrested for the Sanchez murder and the entire Salinas regiment was rounded up for questioning. This whole killing and everything, it's all about drugs. Yeah. Okay. About the trafficking of narcotics and making money. The Salinas police learned from an NF crew member that approval of the Sanchez murder had come from the NF captain, Danny Hernandez. So it comes from Danny to you, Demondo. Mondo gives the order to Roque. Right? We had a good idea relatively quickly who was involved in that crime. Salinas police were intent on bringing down the entire NF regiment, but when they followed the chain of command up to Danny Hernandez, they got a big surprise. As part of the investigation, we became aware that there was an actual informant within the ranks of the New Western Familia. Um, but at the time of the homicide, I don't believe we had information that the FBI was conducting an investigation. Salinas police then found out that Hernandez, their top suspect in the murder conspiracy, was a paid FBI informant. A year before the Cap Saloon murder, Black Widow investigators had given Hernandez a choice, either face life in prison or go undercover for the government. Leo Mondo heard the news in jail. When I found out what was going on with him, it, it messed me up a lot, it messed my mind up. It, it, it never crossed my mind that these guys would try to use me. You know? I know I'm responsible for doing what I did, you know what I'm saying? I, I take responsibility for, for killing Raymond Sanchez. I, I'm not saying I'm innocent, you know what I'm saying? I'm not saying that I'm, I'm this good person that I never done nothing wrong. You know what I'm saying? But at the same time, Daniel Hernandez should have been held accountable and the FBI should have been exposed to what they did. The FBI and the U.S. attorney denied repeated requests for interviews about this case. In court, they insisted Hernandez was not involved in the murder. The FBI says to get evidence, informants are authorized to participate in, but not promote, limited criminal activity. They say informants are tightly controlled. But how tight was the control over Danny Hernandez? Phone records show that phone calls took place between Leo Mando's regiment leader and Hernandez in the days and hours leading up to the murder. But these calls were not recorded by the FBI. Law enforcement has to use informants. Um, it's something that you have to be very, very careful with. And the way that we operate is that if it's not taped, if it's not corroborated, then it's difficult to use. These FBI documents suggest that Hernandez was out of control, committing unauthorized crimes around the time of the murder, dealing drugs, and pocketing thousands of dollars. There is some validity to him being out of control. Working with informants can always be tricky. I mean, they're not police officers. They are usually criminals. And as such, they have a way of getting to information that you wouldn't otherwise get. So it's always a balancing act. And you always leave yourself open to criticism in using someone who's bad. But that's how the world works. The FBI, I feel they let it happen so they can have a case on all of us. And they knew about Raymond Sanchez. How come this guy wasn't notified? How come they didn't let him know, hey, these guys, you know, they're talking about you. You might be getting moved on. You know what I'm saying? That's your job to do if this guy's name's coming up. The FBI said in court that they didn't step in because their informant Hernandez is on tape repeatedly ordering no violence. But other witnesses say Hernandez gave different orders when he was not being monitored, as this police interrogation shows. So basically what he's saying is don't go out and start it, but don't back away from it and lose money out of it. Yeah. yeah. So if yeah. the situation comes up where if you got a hitting, hitting. Yeah. If you have to. Because Hernandez was not monitored round the clock, there is no way to prove whether he gave the green light for the murder. He declined to be interviewed. Tell you straight up, I think he was playing both sides, working for the feds and, and then operating with uh, still as a member. You know, I don't agree with some of the tactics no law enforcement use, but, you know, I don't know they worked for them, worked for them to get rid of people, get rid of them, you know. But I see in the process, a lot of innocent people can also get washed up. When informants tell them about an upcoming murder, FBI regulations say they need to intervene. But in another incident during Black Widow, 
prosecutors told the police not to make arrests until sufficient overt acts were committed. As a result, two people were shot by an NF crew while police investigators waited outside. You have to have something to arrest somebody for. That helps to have the elements of a crime in front of you so that you can actually arrest someone. And if you're in the investigative stages and trying to develop a case on someone, you know, how much is enough? Are we there yet? They're judgment calls that are made by human beings who are not out of the movies. They're your neighbors. And they're, they're people who are fallible, but their aim is, is good and true. And, and they're, they're doing an honorable job and trying to do the right thing. The FBI says Operation Black Widow helped disrupt the NF and led to 75 convictions. But its effectiveness has been questioned, even by the federal judge who presided over the case. Critics say Black Widow cost too much and the FBI was irresponsible in its handling of informants. In spite of his unauthorized criminal activity, Danny Hernandez was recently released from jail he was paid $52,000 by the government. And in the end, the operation didn't achieve its main goal to break up the NF. We can cut the head off that snake all we want and there'll be a new head growing. So we're, we're, we don't ever back off on it and lessen our efforts to address that issue. As a result of Operation Black Widow, the NF is not dead. They will rebuild. It's like any war. If a sniper picks off a general, somebody gets a battlefield promotion. So the next generation of leaders will rise up and they'll be right back in business if the pressure isn't kept on them. It did have an impact on the family, but uh, just a setback. Generals ain't been replaced. They ain't been impeached, so they're still the generals. And wherever the generals go, that's where the mob is. And as a member, really, you ain't got no choice. You know, as a member, your your life evolves around following orders, taking orders, from the lowest rank to the highest rank. Everybody's subject to following orders. You know, and whether you like it or not, that's that's not for you to say. You know, sometimes for just questioning the order could get you killed. While little Mando was awaiting trial for the Sanchez murder his father decided to break his parole on purpose so that he would be able to spend time with his son in jail. My son's gonna do a lot of time. Just thinking about it, I would wake up, he was on the top bunk, and, and it was hitting me. Reality was hitting me, and I literally would cry. I literally would cry. But I remember getting on my knees and praying and asking God, please don't let me cry, cry loud enough that it's gonna wake up my son and he's gonna hear me cry. To me, I felt, you know what, this is part of your punishment for contributing to everything you contributed, the bad part about his life. That kind of pain right there that I felt, I don't desire on my worst enemy. They make you believe that the cause is a certain way, you know what I'm saying? And you believe that, believe that, until you get to the point, you start being exposed to a lot of things, until you get into the mix so deep, you know, until you start getting involved as far as, you know, the money, the uh, people getting moved on, you start seeing all this betrayal. You believe all that until you start seeing the real deal, you know what I mean? I started seeing everything for real, the way it really is, and that's what discouraged me to a lot of things, you know? When I seen the realities that personally affected my son and the way things happened, the, the, the informant and everything, you know, the FBI had working for them and, and all that dirty stuff, you know, um, like I said, I'm, I'm thankful that I never made those type of commitments. And I just hope that people um, open their eyes, you know, and let them answer it for themselves, you know. Is it worth it? The 
city of Salinas is still suffering. The violence is worsening, and with the city's current financial crisis, it's hard to know how to stop it. Javier Fernandez Garcia, November 13, 2004. Marco Antonio Velasquez, November 14, 2004. Each year, the names of the dead are read aloud. The police crackdown has not stopped the shooting, and the families are angry. Hi, my name is Julian Soto. Um, my dad and two uncles were shot all in cars due to gang violence. And I know that one day, People are beginning to ask whether law enforcement operations like Black Widow are enough. If you don't want your kid to, to die out in some drive-by, out in some rumble, out in, out in the streets, then start talking to them about the realities about gangs. Start going, taking them to programs, start getting help, man, you know, stop it. Slipping in and out of weird moods on a daily basis, walking on these streets and I can't find my smiling faces. Armando Frias is out on parole and has given up gangs for good. He works loading cargo in Salinas. In his spare time, he's helping with anti-gang programs like Barrios Unidos that give kids an alternative to the gang life. But money is tight. Most anti-gang programs have lost funding. That's a catch-22 uh, because when Libraries get closed, rec centers get closed, after school programs get closed, um, your nonprofits start losing funding, so they get closed. Uh, that, that automatically is going to create more calls for service for the police. Law enforcement has to take uh, a huge role because you have to identify the guys who are beyond help, people who have shot and killed someone, people who are, are so entrenched in it that you, you can't change them, you got to isolate them. It's, it's not just a law enforcement problem, it's a community problem, but the seduction process is so entrenched. I can get into this gang thing, and I'm gonna have buddies, I'm gonna have friends, I'm gonna have a lot of fun, excitement, danger, and so that seduction is, is very, very difficult to defeat by saying, hey, why don't we go and play basketball? You could put all the money you want into law enforcement. It's not helping the problem as far as there's a cure for this disease, because that's what it's like sometimes. It's like a disease, it's like an epidemic. You know, it's killing people. And, and you need to find a cure. You need to find something that works, not something that's just gonna bandage it up a little bit, you know, and the bleeding's gonna stop for a little while and everybody's gonna be happy. You know, you really gotta get to the root of the problems. People may disagree about funding priorities, but what everyone agrees on is that the community needs to stand up, educate the kids about gangs, and unite. The same ideas from the time of Cesar Chavez. I most definitely still believe in a lot of the stuff that Cesar Chavez implemented and taught, fighting injustices. I believe in unity. You know, I believe in respect. All these things that I fought for back in, in the times of gangs, the only thing is the motives that I carry out now are a lot different. How can I contribute to community or how can I be there and help fight an injustice that's happening to my family if I'm in prison? I can't fight for them in prison. I can't, I can't be there for them. Violence was what got me in prison. Violence is not the solution. For those that have passed, that are still here. Kind of crazy out there. You never know. If no solutions are found, the next generation will repeat the mistakes of their fathers. You gotta beware. Look out now. Watch your back. Deborah Aguilar wants to keep her son's memory alive. 
she continues her fight for the kids of Salinas. Well, the way to stop violence in Salinas is for us mothers to bring our faith together and stand together. My three children that are still living here, and I pray to God that they will be bearing me and not the reverse. Since production ended on this film, Operation Black Widow has come to a close. Five top NF leaders have been moved from Pelican Bay to a federal supermax prison for the rest of their lives. But even the federal judge who sentenced them worried that this outcome may simply spread the Nuestra Familia gang nationwide. Now California gang investigators confirm that the generals have already set up a national branch of the NF from federal prison. Leo Mando has left the Nuestra Familia. He signed a plea agreement for 29 years to life for the murder of Raymond Sanchez. Like his father, he'll be in prison as his own son grows up. When I had my son and I knew he was gonna be a boy, I had so many plans. That's, that's you know, that's my biggest regret, you know. I, I wanna just do something positive with his life, you know what I'm saying? Something good, you know? Something that nobody in my family has done. Armando Frias Sr. is helping to raise his grandson and has vowed to keep him out of gangs. was funded in part by the Kaiser Family Foundation.